This is a really famous classic episode. Today, I'm having a conversation with Eric Bergen. Eric is currently an actor on the TV series Madam Secretary. He plays Blake Moran, Elizabeth McCord's assistant. He's not the first person I've spoken to on Madam Secretary. I also have an episode with Tim Daly, who plays Elizabeth McCord's husband. You'll find a link in the show notes if you want to listen to that conversation. Eric is also a stage performer. Earlier this year, he was in the Broadway musical Waitress, which was originally a movie that starred Carrie Russell, who we know from the Americans, and Nathan Fillion. And here's a fun factoid. He's in a show called The Rookie right now, Nathan Fillion, and he was one of the very first celebrities I ever interviewed for a print magazine called Time Out New York. Um, years ago when he was guest starring in the show Desperate Housewives. Getting back to Eric, Eric also toured with Jersey Boys and he was in the film version. So if you want to check him out there, go ahead and do it. He is a musician as well. So he performs in concerts and Eric just released his first new single called Running Through the Night and a second single called Better in the Dark. And there are a few more that are about to come out. Lucky us, Eric gave us permission to play his singles, at least the two that have already been released, at the end of the show. So stay tuned after our talk, you will hear his music. Before we get started, just a reminder that if you would like to give a gift of a personalized, private, really famous podcast episode, it won't air here, but you can keep it and give it as a gift or hold on to it as a keepsake. Now's the time to get started. That's right. I will interview you. I will interview your grandpa, I'll interview your mom, your daughter, your brother, your boss, co-worker, anybody, your best friend, get it all on record. Do you want to know about how your parents met or your grandparents met? Do you want to know what your first pet was? Do you want to know how your boss got started in the industry? I'll ask it all. I'll package it as a really famous episode with the really famous music. I'll add an intro, an outro, and I will send it over to you and you can do whatever you like with it. To get started, just click on the show notes. There's a link right in there or go to reallyfamouspodcast.com. Now back to Eric and me. I met him very recently on a beautiful fall day. It was like 72 degrees out. We had the window open in his apartment in New York and we just kind of sat back and talked about some things. Here we are, Eric Bergen and me. A face for podcasting is what I have. A face for podcasting. I, I don't had a think podcast. so. What? I had a podcast. Shut up. I knew Adam Curry and, and uh, we, I started a podcast in 2003 out of my dorm room. I um well I was always I was always obsessed with, um, for lack of a better term, arts and entertainment. I was always obsessed with the show business, really. And uh, yeah, you can put it on the uh, on Michael's face. We have oh Michael my, Jackson right. uh, drink coasters here that we're using for those just, listening. Yeah, I just lifted my glass of water yeah. to take a sip, and I saw Michael Jackson's yeah, face. Yeah, that happens in this apartment. Me. Yeah, you can put it on the coaster or on the glass. Either way, I'm cool. Um, yeah, so I was I was always obsessed with kind of. Not just doing it, but talking about it. I always loved the discussion of music and writing and how things worked. And I, I, I always wanted to know people's way into the business. People's, you know, not, not even so much like the, the deep, dark, artsy stuff. But I always wanted to know things like, what's your, what is your regimen in a day? Like, wh how do I become a writer? How do I, you know, I wanted to know the day-to-day -day routine of the people that, uh, I loved and um, I don't know I just I'm a big talker uh, as evidenced by the past few minutes and uh, I, I, I started this uh, podcast in my dorm room in college at North Carolina School of the Arts um, uh, with my friend Dylan Heffler uh, and we both were trying to figure out how it worked and like we didn't quite know what an RSS feed was like which for those of you who don't know is the is the technology behind how you get this podcast how it actually shows up in your in your uh, 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 inbox uh, as it were um, so did you have to write the code or was there a you know and then there was this company called Libsyn who uh, uh, was just starting out who you basically they were they basically said no, no no just give us the audio file we'll do the rest and I was one of the first people to use that okay so um, Libsyn hosts really famous do they really they sure do well, there you go so they're they're still up and thriving and, Thri and for sure I think they have the majority of podcasts well like the biggest ones I like to take responsibility for them. that it is all because of you Eric. thank you so much um, 
And yeah, and we did it. And I think like the biggest name I got at the time was Donny Osmond to be on the show. You got Donny Osmond on I the did. podcast? It was all about, it was, it, it was all Skype interviews. So we did it all literally from my dorm. Um, and it was, what helped me was the fact that I knew what I was talking about. Like, because I'm a music nerd and because I'm uh, kind of a, a nerd about all things show business and, and I hate the term pop culture because that kind of includes the Kardashians and the Real Housewives which I know nothing about but um, uh, you know th- I know a lot about music and movies and theater and I think having really nerdy for lack of a better term nerdy um, uh, uh, knowledge and questions and I could talk about things it always got me in the door but I also found that lying got me in the door. I mean, I, I had to fake who I was and who I, I never said I was in college, but you know, I'd say we're the number one, you know, arts and entertainment podcast. And it was such, it was such in the early days of podcasting that people were interested in jumping on the bandwagon. If you were, if you had smart people surrounding you and, uh, I, so, and there was no information that that disproved my statements, you know. So I, I kind of kind of uh, lied my way through it to get the people on until it actually did become a popular. That is podcast. really an awesome story. But I bet that a lot of people didn't know back then what a podcast was. Were they like, "What's a podcast?" Well, it was right. <sighs> no, I think I think at that time podcasting was a thing. I mean, it was like two thousand and. 2003, 2004 is when I was doing it, and there was it, iTunes had just put podcasts, I think, on their their uh, platform. Yeah, or maybe it was even before that. But I think that's it was before ve- that. that's still very early. Like it was before very early. Serial, a lot of people didn't know about podcasts. Like the podcast Serial really opened people. Well, that was just eyes. like two years ago. I know this is what I'm oh, saying. Oh wow. Okay, so no, this was this was the real early days. This is like something in the girl was a podcast. Um, Joe and the girl did something I don't know something like that that was a big one there was mommy cast was a big one and then the the the, the insidery kind of like news about podcasting one was this thing called daily source quote daily source code um, by Adam Curry who was kind of the uh, pod father um, and uh, he and I connected with him um, you know the funny thing is I didn't actually listen to a lot of podcasts back in the day I listened to daily source code c- to get the news on podcasting but I actually didn't listen to podcasts regularly um, like I do now. What do you listen to now? What do I listen to now? Well, I haven't listened to anything since like this past summer. Um, Wait, you I, mean I listen- you're not listening to Really Famous every Monday but no, but when a new I episode will. is released? Now I'll go back and binge the whole thing. Um, uh, I know I was doing a lot of the NPR stuff. Um, I did listen to Serial. Um, uh, God, what else? What else is there? I don't know. I feel like I have a list. It's like my Netflix list. I have a list of podcasts and TV shows like we all do that we have guilt that we haven't listened to yeah, yet. Yeah, it's a cute. Yeah. Right. That's why I don't have too many podcasts that I listen to because that's exactly the kind of thing that'll happen. And I'll feel like, oh no, there's so many episodes I'm missing. Right. So I have really just a, a select you pick few. Your, yeah, you've, mm-hmm. you've done a good edit. My problem is, is that I don't, if I was driving, you know, if I was in LA and I had a car, I think I would listen to a, a lot more podcasts. But being a New Yorker, you know, you're putting in music in your ears when you're in the subway and things like that. Oh, we've turned a computer on. Uh, <laughs> That's okay, Victoria. Uh, we, um, you know, if I lived in LA, uh, I, I would be listening to podcasts more, I think, in the car. I, I don't have a car in New York City. You know, I'm going around um, on the subways and walking places and I'm putting in music to drown out the sound of people talking. So I, podcasts are not really a thing that I'm going to listen to uh, in, in, around New York City all that much. And when I'm home, I'm usually usually listening to music or silence. Um, but uh, when I'm traveling, I do. I'll, I'll have yeah, they're on good the plane for planes. Today. Exactly, yes, yes, they're good yes, for yes. planes too, and yes. they're good for if you're walking a dog, let's say, in a park. Let's really? say you're in Central Park. Yeah, see, that seems scary to me. I think the New Yorker in me is don't put if you're walking a dog or something like that. Don't have earphones in because someone's going to come up behind you and like mug you or something. Yeah, but it's not music, right? So there's a lot of silence going on. It depends on the oh. kind of podcast you're listening to. But like okay. if it's one like this, you're listening to two people's voices, right. and it's not doesn't really drown anything out, like you said right. so you're still hearing what's going on around you very calming voices so exactly people are going to walk their dogs <laughs> that's with right us. walk their dogs to this so let's flip a little to okay. madam secretary
Carrey. Oh, sure. So I don't think that we met. However, I was on the set one day. Were you? When? Yeah, I believe it was the first season. I was... I was younger then. (laughs) So was I. Oh, okay. Thought it was just me. (laughs) Um, I was interviewing... The costume designer is it still Amy? Amy Raw. Yeah, uh, she's she doesn't work on the show currently. She's uh. been doing. Uh, she was pulled in so many directions. She's so so much in demand. So she has gone to movies and other shows and and things like that. But she's certainly set up. She was with us for uh, four years, um, and then her uh, associate Steph took over um, and r- runs it beautifully. And and. Uh, it's it's so interesting because how important the costumes are to that show, and you wouldn't necessarily think of it because it's really just you know suits and business suits. But it's interesting how important the costumes are to this show specifically. Um, uh, but yeah, did you like talking to Amy? Yeah, I did like talking to her. I was doing a story for the Hollywood Reporter, so I was a journalist before uh-huh. this. So I did print stories and interviews for print stories. And digital. Um, so I was doing a story for the Hollywood Reporter about the costume design for Taya Leone oh, and yeah. how it compared to Hillary Clinton's wardrobe. Oh, oh, oh uh huh. So it was interesting. Yeah. And I was there for a few hours, and I met. That's where I met Tim Daly, who yes. I later interviewed. Great. Here, I'm not here at he your wasn't, apartment. No, you didn't interview him, him <laughs> in my apartment. No. <laughs> right. For but for the podcast. Yes. And Lou Gossett Jr. was on set that day. So oh, I, met I remember him. that day. Do you remember? That was the um, yeah, because he was in the he was in the kitchen watching something on. Yep. Oh, I know what it is. It was the episode where she storms. She she does something wild in the middle of a speech, and she that she wasn't supposed to. She was supposed to stick to the script. Something at the United Nations or or something like that, and she goes off script. I just remember. I think that's this. I think that's the scene where I'm like chewing the crackers eating in the background the whole time which has become a meme uh, or a gif amongst my friends is this gif of just an animated picture of me eating crackers uh, yeah I, I, think, I think that's that episode of course I could be so wrong because we've done so many episodes at this point that I've lost right, track there's a lot but I don't remember what was going on in the episode but you were right about the fact that it was in the kitchen yeah he's watching her yeah. on screen yeah, yeah 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 I remember that I remember, I remember that. so I watched that scene being filmed as well like I was talking to him before talking to Tim and to him mm-hmm. and then they went and filmed that scene yeah we get, uh, we get some incredible guest stars on our show i mean we get it's the show that everyone wants to work on and i always hear this from uh, we have a lot of guest stars and we have a lot of recurring guest stars as well who work on other shows and they when they come to our show they always say you guys don't know how good you have it this set is the best to work on the most fun and i you know i didn't know what that meant i thought it was just kind of blowing smoke i thought they say that wherever they go and then everyone started saying it. And they st- I started. Ex- I asked, and people started explaining. It's the most kind, respectful, chill, fun set. That's just kind of very. Um, no one's walking on eggshells. It's just kind of actors all coming together to make the best uh, best television possible. You know, given the eight days that we have to do it. Um, so there was an episode recently that was very exciting. It was the beginning of this season, yeah, right? Yeah. The, so the season, who was there? Season five, season premiere. Well, our guest stars were Madeleine Albright, Colin Powell, and Hillary Clinton. That is like amazing. It was and wild. Major. Yeah, it was wild. It was wild. I mean, and we, you know, it was it was uh, it was kind of shocking to see that. I mean, you know, these are people who are public servants. They're not, they they're they're not used to celebrity, but there we were fawning over them. Um, and I think kind of regardless of your politics to see those people in, in person when we've kind of watched them forever on television. Right, like a, regular human beings right, they right, were. Right, Did, right. Was that weird? Like seeing them life no, size? Be, no, because they're so, they're so not wanting to be celebrities. They're so not into being... But I mean, it was weird just to see them like walking around as like yes. regu- regular size, as you, like your size. Correct. You know what I mean? Well, Madeline Albright's very small. She's not my size. Okay, okay. She's very, very small. Um, but no, of course, it is. It, yeah, and they're they're so smart and they're so um, uh, nice and they're all big fans of the show. I mean, they, they really do watch the show. Um, 
so that was really cool to have them all of a sudden speak about oh that episode where you guys like what you actually watch this thing and they do um, uh, you know which is so funny because you know, me being like from the theater I didn't watch Smash I couldn't watch Smash the, you know the idea of or, it's like doctors watching Grey's Anatomy wait like, so you, you didn't you felt like you didn't want to or did you try and you didn't like it Smash yeah I watched the first episode I had a lot of friends involved and I I don't know I just kind of thought I didn't want to no it felt like it felt like watching how a sausage is made but not really it was like that's not how it is or that I was I was I wouldn't oh. be good at at thinking okay this is for television this is for and that's just me because I have plenty of people in uh friends of mine who work in musical theater who love that show. Okay, so for you, the issue was not that you were doing it all the time, but that it wasn't really that accurately reflecting Correct. your reality. Correct. I mean, that show was very fantasy-driven in all aspects. Got uh, it. Even just from seeing, I think, the first two episodes that I saw. Um, you know, going back, there's incredible music in it and things like that. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's, I, it's like I can't imagine doctors wanting to watch Grey's Anatomy. Well, I'll tell you what. There was a show. So I was a therapist before I was a journalist. Uh -huh. So for me, that show was in treatment. So you may be a little young the, for is that. Is that the Gabriel Byrne? Yes. Yeah, where he did. It was a different um, patient each night. For like a season, I think. Or for a week, maybe it was. So like he would have, let's say. I thought it was like Monday nights, it was patient number one. Monday, Tuesday nights. And oh, that, you week know what? I don't week. know because I couldn't watch it. I was like, oh, I am watching this show and it's like bothering me. And I don't think it was because it was unrealistic. I think it was different because I felt like I'm at work or something again. It was kind of felt like burdensome sure. or something. But if, when you're training to be a therapist or when you are a therapist, do you listen to other people's therapy sessions is that part of your training that you listen to recordings of therapy sessions or is there do you talk to other therapists about oh god i had this one patient who blah 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 blah, blah. i mean is is there that or is it all very in the room happens in the room very interesting question and you just made me think of something that I haven't thought about probably since I did it, which was in grad school. I remember they were teaching us about different theories of psychology. Uh -huh. So there was one, uh, I guess you call him a psychologist, uh, Carl Rogers, I want to say, but I may be getting him wrong. And his focus was client focused so we would watch these videos of him letting the client lead the way um but yeah we watched some videos in grad school but after that um it was pretty minimal so most of it just happens in the room although if you watch the sopranos did you yeah, well, yeah, but her, those, those so, famous sessions. Right, so, yeah. so you saw the sessions between Dr. Melfi and Tony, but at the same time, Dr. Melfi had her own therapist, supervisor, right, right. Right, who she would discuss the sessions with Tony with right, him. Right, right. So um, there, there can be some of that with supervision. So when I was working at another organization, I had some of that where I would talk about it a little bit. But most of it was... It's not like when was, you're in the musical theater and you listen to old cast no, recordings mm -mm. of how someone sang that song or technique or anything like that. No. You're not listening to old therapy sessions. Because I'm telling you, that is, was the one time I saw old therapy sessions was wow. on this video at Columbia. That was right. it. Did the, the at Columbia was that it was that therapy session? Did the patient know they were being videoed? No, this was the films that they showed us of the old guy in the fifties, the old therapist doing oh, therapy practice, sessions, fake sessions, real sessions. Oh. But, they, but they videotaped it. But did then, they know they were being videotaped? They had to have been right. That would be unethical if they didn't. Okay, but that. But begs, then it would influence it. That's my of question, course. which is my problem with reality television. No, I shouldn't say my problem with reality television. I mean, who really cares? But you know, the reality television, the whole idea that what you're watching is real. It's like if you put a camera in front. Of, I mean, I'm holding a microphone right now. I'm I'm speaking way differently than I would if the microphones were down. And we weren't recording. Not that I'm saying anything different thematically, but the way I'm presenting myself is very different than I would if the microphones were down. And I just, ha I always wonder that once you put those cameras on, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a very different thing. And of course, what's so funny is, even on Madam Secretary, what we're aiming for the whole time is to be as natural as possible. So it's basically like, okay, do what you were doing before the cameras were on. I mean, it really, it, acting really is this kind of fake psychology uh, thing. It's, you have to, fake realness which is just what you were doing if you just don't fake it to begin with I mean it's this weird twisted yeah it's bizarre thing. but yeah. you brought up a good point too because 
as I mentioned when I first came in, this is the first episode where we're using handheld microphones. Uh And I had always used lavalier mics before, which for anybody who doesn't know, we just kind of clip them onto our... It's like what newscasters wear. Exactly. So they get clipped on and you're talking, you're not holding anything at all. You're just talking as you normally do. And I always felt like that was a really important component because it was natural. And so a lot of the... Most of our talks are natural. Yes. I still think though, if you put a lav mic on you're still aware that it's there you at least for me i don't forget that it's there in fact in a weird way i kind of because i started as a singer because i started as a wanting to be a a rock star you know i had i was holding a microphone from a very early age i mean i made made my my mom buy me a, a microphone because i saw michael jackson do it on mtv and i thought that you know that was my that was my catalyst into all things show business was MTV and being a a pop star and and wanting to be a pop star and holding a microphone was like the ultimate energy it was a a painter with a paintbrush it was a typewriter to a writer for me it was a microphone so I feel much more comfortable when I'm holding a handheld microphone at all times I mean I if I could walk around all day with one of these things the control and the power of holding a (laughs) handheld mic I'm telling you. <laughs> you you should do it. It doesn't have to be plugged in. Just go for it. In, in the Walk early years, around. it wasn't plugged in. In the early years of me performing in my apartment, my, the apartment that I grew up in, for my parents, it wasn't plugged into anything. And I didn't know the difference, really. I mean, I didn't I didn't care. I just It was the power of holding that in your hands and how immediately people, you know, looked and listened. I say you walk around New York City from now on with a microphone in your hand. Well, the hand. thing is, if you walk around Midtown, there's already plenty of people doing that <laughs> anyway true. on street That's corners, true. hawking something. And they are so, plugged in. And they are plugged in. Uh, so I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be too impressive here. But um, yeah, maybe, maybe I should, maybe I can make it part of my thing. You know, that's so, just my thing. <laughs> totally, I think you should. Okay. Um, reality TV show. So yeah. you were saying that. You know, once I agree, once the cameras are there, so even some reality shows, they have a lot of like producers and writers in there kind of setting up scenarios uh-huh. for them, I think. Yeah. And then others, maybe less so, but just having the cameras there will, I'm sure, influence them. So what do you watch? Like, what shows are you thinking about? Well, well, I'll, I'll answer that in one second, but just another point about that. It's, it's the same thing with theater, right? You know, the theater is... The thing about television when you're making television, uh, scripted television, is that you're 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 very aware of the cameras because it's a very technical thing. In fact, you're, you're trying to find your light. You don't want to block that person's light when you're filming their coverage. You don't want to, you you know, you want to make sure you hit your mark because that's where they've set you to be on the set. Um, so you are very aware of the cameras, but you you kind of get used to that. The, the difference is for theater. And, and by the way, you're. It's not high stakes when you're filming television because you can cut. If you mess up, you just say, line, what is it? And then you go back. It's very natural. When you do theater and you can't go back and there are, you know, let's say 1,300 pairs of eyeballs staring at you, that is an energy that you feel incredibly and you are, it it, it rushes through your body. Um... And that's a whole different thing. That's similar to reality television, right? Because in, re- in quote unquote reality television, those cameras are kind of following whatever happens. And in theater, it's the same thing. I mean, you're you are following whatever happens. You're supposed to s- skip to, uh, stick to the script, but you can choose not to in that moment if you wanted to. You could strip off all your clothing and do, and you would have that energy. You would be in control of 1,300 people and how they react in that moment. And that's a power that's very similar to holding, I mean, it's 10 times as intense of holding a microphone, is holding the gaze and the energy of 1,300 people. And that's why I love the theater so much. And I think that's why theater is still so highly regarded to actors. People are like, I really want to do it. Or they're like, oh my God, no, I could never. Or... uh they they're addicted to it and they you know they they go from show to show to show because that they they thrive off that. I don't know why I brought that up so much. I just mean to say that um <laughs> explain yourself. No, of course we, things just happen in our heads. We think of something when we're thinking or talking about something right. else and then we talk about it. That's we talk just about how it. humans are. Yes, it's and all I just good. I just wanted to say that because I think that what I think that 
the experience of seeing theater from an audience perspective, you know, it is 10 times as intense being on stage. Right. I don't mean work. I mean the intensity of all those people staring at you when you're one in a crowd all looking in the same direction but when you're the only person facing the opposite direction it's a little you feel naked that's a little crazy it's a little crazy and you know i think that's i i I think that's a little similar to reality television in a way you know if it's actually real um uh but that's that's the one you know that's that's a, a, a just again talking about the psychology and, and performing and, and why we do what we do so on that topic what happens when you step away from the stage and like the production is over the show is over just that uh-huh. evening's performance is over right. let's say um then what happens psychologically well you have to become good at the balance i mean you hear about these rock stars you know especially back in the day when they were on tour and they you know just coming down off the show they would have to take drugs to to come down from that and then of course you need the upper you know to do the next show which is why they space out shows over the course of of days you never do two shows in in a row things like that for Um, the drug recovery well i don't want to say for the drug recovery just i just mean the coming off the high of performing i mean i know that when i do a one night concert you know because i don't because of my schedule i don't really do tours so i when i do my music stuff and i do a concert here or there you know just going back to the hotel room after that one show is i mean it's a lot what i'm good at because of theater and the eight show a week schedule is balancing so you don't blow your wad on stage in one thing but you know rock stars do that's where they're you know they give it their all on that stage and then that's what it's about that's what it's about they have to right they should right right um but theater is a little bit different and uh you know when you come off stage on tuesday night you have a show tomorrow at 2 2 p.m in you know in the afternoon so you have to not only do you have to balance yourself on stage while performing to still give it your all in a way that doesn't give it all away so you don't have anything tomorrow and then uh, you have to, you have your, your routine, your regimen, tea, or re- whatever it is that you do that gets you more uh, on, a, on a balanced level because uh, it can, you, know, you, can't, you can't blow it. So what happens that night after you have that one night concert and then you go to the hotel room? Like then where are you like emotionally and what do you do? Well, it's so funny. I never, I was never, I never did drugs. I, I never was a drug guy. I was never interested in it. Um, you know, tried pot a couple of times and never liked the feeling, never really loved it, and never I've never done anything more intense than uh, uh, pot. Is that what they call it now? Here's how square I am. I don't even know if that's what you call it. But um, it, I remember coming, going back to my hotel room once after a concert and thinking, oh, now I get it. Now I get why, why people go there. Now I, now I get the, the disease of what that addiction is because for the first time I felt if I could just have something to help me get out of this rush right now so I can sleep or I can just come down from that high I mean that is a thing to feel all those people staring at you or 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 applauding for you or singing along or screaming and being alert you know the type of show that I do I talk to the audience a lot and so sometimes people yell things back at me and you have to be alert enough to uh, say things back to them and, and not just get freaked out and run off stage, you know? And, and while I've gotten good at it, that doesn't mean that it's not the same feeling as it was the first time where you're like, oh my God, what am I doing? Right. Uh, the rush of being on stage is something that is addictive, but if you don't take care of yourself, uh, it, can, it can just wipe you out. They can just wipe you out. So what about leading up to a performance? Like, are there nerves, excitement? You know the adrenaline rush is coming. I feel way more comfortable on stage than I do off stage. My social anxiety uh, in, in a room full of four people or a room full of 20 people at a party um, is very strong. But if you hand me a microphone... And if there's a piano nearby, or even if there's not a piano nearby, but if you give me a microphone and you put a bunch of people facing me and I have to entertain them, uh, 
I'm ready to go without without thinking of it. I don't know what to say at a party full of 20 people or when I'm introduced to someone. Oh, this is so-and-so. Meet. Hi. And then I go, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Um, so what do you do? I usually find the quickest way out. He's like, oh, excuse me for one second. I have to take this call. Uh, so you're like out in the hall with yourself? I'm out in the hall. Oh, my God. I can't tell you how many bathrooms I've hidden in at parties. Um, I'm so bad at it. I just feel... I, d- I don't know what to say, but I know how to entertain. So that's interesting, right? Because people are watching you at a dinner party or whatever it is. Or, right. Or standing around or whatever it is. They're watching you, but you feel like you can't just perform. Well, no, because I mean, I'm saying if it's a, if it's like a party where it's my party, like if I'm yeah, hosting it. Yeah, then you it, can perform because well, you're the then, host. Then I'm performing, yeah. right. Then I'm, then I'm essentially performing. A, a friend of mine um, lost his uh, longtime uh partner uh a few years ago and there was you know sitting shiva and there was a a gathering at really a celebration of of this man's life um a gathering at his house a few days later and it was you know just packed and uh my friend was so joyful is the wrong word but he he seemed to be so um uh, not this tragic figure and so sad that I thought he was going to be and he was walking around and laughing telling great stories about his partner all these things and then you know I saw him on his side I said you, you seem okay he's like well I'm performing right now the crash will be tomorrow and I think that's what it is I think there's people people who, who know how to put on a show either behind the scenes or, or on stage we know how to put on a show at all times you know, and, and oftentimes the putting on the show is the is the is the drug. It is the way to get through something, um, and so I think I, I, I think performing is very easy for me. So if I'm the center of attention at a party, or if I'm hosting the party, I know what to do with myself. I know what's expected of me. I know how to be me i just don't know how to do it um you know just like hanging out i know how to do it one-on-one with a person i know how to do it with really close friends but like yep, yep. groups of people just mm-hmm. like everyone let's just go out like a dinner party i'm like oh can i sit next yeah. to someone i know and i have by the way all my friends are like this like i've surrounded myself with people who are the same as me um and these are musicians singers writers we all know what to do if we are quote unquote performing and we can do it at the drop of a hat we don't need rehearsal it comes out of us like spit and it uh it, but you know put us in a room full of people we don't know oh but what oh. if that, if it's a room if it's a dinner party just with you guys then what oh then we're fine then everybody's fine oh my god yeah so then it's we're only good. with like people you don't really know well or at all right right, right. i gotcha I that's why you see performers oftentimes are you a lot of artists people with long careers they they've had the same like if you look at a lot of like the very famous artists that are still with us they've had the same friends for like forever they've just carried them with them they because it's you know you you create yeah. your family of those people i've i've certainly done that and it's with a me. comfort zone it's it total feels good and zone. insular and in a good way absolutely so i think it's you know I, I, some people say you know that's an illness but you know for me it's been my saving grace i mean for me what has me being comfortable on stage has given me a career um uh, so what if you know? So what if the side effects are some weird social cues? <laughs> right, right, right. So what is your family like? Tell me about your. Uh, my family. Uh, well, my dad, my parents, um, they are uh, alive and well. Um, I don't know. Well, no, they're fine. Um, <laughs> uh, no, they're great. They're pr- they're listening to this right now. Um, they got divorced when I was five years old. They met here in New York City. My dad was, uh, they were both, they both wanted to be actors, but like not really. They did this thing called Est, which was... uh, Oh, Est. Okay. The Americans. Call us the Americans. Sorry, that's what I think of when I think of Est. Yes, 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 totally. I think now it's morphed into something called Landmark Forum. But you know, it's a self, a self-help's the wrong word, but it's very new age growth you know what I'm I, I'm talking out of turn. I actually don't know what it is, uh, but they. It's, I think it's, I think that is what it is. Okay, though. good. But I'm not that. really sure either. All right, 
And then they did, there was something called the Mastery, which was here at the Actors Institute in New York. It was very, you know, late 70s, early 80s of its time where it was just kind of a thing to do through presentation and acting, but it wasn't like real traditional acting class. Um, it was more becoming a better person, all that, you know, hippy-dippy stuff. Um, but they met and did that. My dad had a cabaret act at the duplex downtown. Um uh, where he opened with Stephen Sondheim's Everybody Says Don't, Everybody Says Don't, Everybody Says Don't Walk on the Grass. Uh, and That was nice. Thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, sure. And uh, then they got married, had me, and divorced. And what's so great is they get along. They get along great. I mean, they, they, they have, you know, they don't hang out with each other, you know, outside of me, but they, they've come to every last little thing I've done um, and shown up sitting next to each other with their significant others that they've both had for the past almost 15 years, I think, at this point. Um, uh, we've, always, we've never been a, a part as a family. That term broken family was always so stupid to me. I understand that's a real thing, but for divorce to mean, oh, you have a broken family, it's like, no, no, no. But the broken family is when, was when they were married and not getting along. What fixed it was them splitting up and and making themselves happy people the renovated family the renovated family absolutely uh and so they're great i mean they're they're uh uh they they mom actually mom started a um uh, a podcast after i did called craft cast which was an arts and crafts kind of interviewing um you know great craft folk uh and then she morphed it into this company it's still called Craftcast. Now, what it does, it focuses more on um, online uh, learning, um, interactive learning. So you can log on. You know, you, you you buy a class, and you what you get is an interactive class learning some really cool art, new arts and crafts thing with the main teacher from that field, and then my mom kind of hosting and moderating. And you can you know click to ask a question. You can it's that's very cool. Your mom wild. is like yeah. technologically no, she, well, not only ahead that, but she's also time. writing the code. I mean, she what? yeah, good for her. I know it's kind of crazy. She she does all she does the hosting, the producing, the graphics, the code, and then sometimes she sleeps. So um, where can we find that? Craftcast.com. C-R-A-F-T-C-A-S-T. Yeah, like podcast, but craft. And no K's or anything like that thrown in? Uh, no. <laughs> Although my friend, my I think, what is it? My friend Jim Caruso calls it Crafts with Katie, both with a K. He can never remember the, the title. So he always, what's your mom's show? Crafts with Katie. Um, and your dad? My dad has, uh, my dad, uh, a really interesting story. He started from Pittsburgh um, and he started as a, uh, a buyer in the men's department at the men's department at Kaufman's, which was the kind of the Bloomingdale's of uh, the Pittsburgh area, and he was in menswear for uh, the longest time, and and was uh, one of the early. Uh, he was the head of the leather goods department for V Saint Laurent. Um, did I sound French when I said that, or just so, stupid? So much. V Saint Laurent, um, and he's kind of it's been Laurent in and out well. of. He's been in and out of both menswear and the promotional products department uh, for years. He's very much a performer too. I mean, a lot of his business is doing uh, trade shows where he has to kind of hawk his wares and he stands in the middle of a room trying to get attention, you know, more so than the guy in the booth next to him. So I definitely come from, uh, you know, dad was always more the, the salesman, the, certainly the presentation guy, and I definitely got that from him and mom was way more in the background you know making the lights look good making the she was an art director for a long time and a, and a, a stylist and and put, putting together direct mail catalogs and kids costume catalog disney adventures was hers um so she was all behind the scenes making everything look good so i i got both of those talents mm-hmm. yeah, yeah yeah trying to you know the 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 producing of things and making things look good, but then also wanting to be the person up front to sell it to you. Right. That's a good combination. Yeah. Well, it, it's a good combination. What it results in is uh, a, a little bit of micromanaging that I, I have to always remind myself, you know, hire the best people and then let them do their job. Um, but I, I tend to be a person who micromanages uh, and I have to not do that. Are you a control freak? Um, yeah, absolutely. In everyday life? Yeah. How? 
Oh God. I mean, I've, I've, I mean, I'm just a control freak all the way around. Every possible thing you can think of. Okay, Everything so your you... apartment is very nice and yeah. neat. Yeah. So that you did every ounce of it yourself, I decorated did. it and I did. organized it and everything looks like it yeah. just perfectly fits. Yeah, I'm the type of person who like, um, I can't go to bed until uh, every article of clothing is put away in the closet in the order the color the colors have to be in order oh wait i left that pair of pants in the dryer no i have to get up go get those jeans put them in the I yeah, well you can't them. really leave them in the dryer anyway they're gonna get wrinkled that's true that's a that's a very general thing i don't even know the best example i can just i mean i am you know things where people are like normally like oh no one's gonna see that it's in the background or the, the biggest thing my freak out is the spelling of my name Okay, because it's E R I C H, but nobody spells it like that, probably. Correct. Correct. Well, the, yeah, I mean, Eric Fromm, but that's, you know. Uh, yeah, and I freak out. It drives me nuts when people, including friends of mine, will write an email and spell it wrong. And I know that some of it is just an iPhone, you know, autocorrect. But what I don't understand is like when I'm doing, if I'm performing at a concert or if I'm part of an event or something like that, and they'll put out a poster or press release that, you know that the name is spelled wrong and they'll go oh my gosh i'm so sorry well on the next round we'll we'll correct it i said no 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 you have to pull the posters have them all destroyed oh well we can't they've already been distributed well then i i suggest that you go get on get in your car and go undistribute those posters otherwise i'm not in it like i have a full meltdown really yeah, yeah, yeah. so what do they do uh, sometimes that's worked in my favor. Sometimes that's not. <laughs> How is it not working? What, what happened? Oh, just because people can be like, "What are you talking about? Relax." I mean, if you're a diva or something. Yeah, but by the way, like I'm hap- I'm okay having the the term. You know, diva is always put on people who want perfection, and I'm like, what's wrong with that? Like, I don't understand why anyone why we're doing this if we're not going for perfect. Like, so you think what- it has a negative connotation? Is that what you mean? The word diva, or are we talking about just your name specifically? No, no, no. I mean, the term diva has. Mm-hmm. Been, mm-hmm. has been used in a negative way yeah. when I don't think I understand if someone's being a diva over things that don't matter you know the the, the famous red M&M's in my dressing room thing although what that I, I didn't know that there's a reason for that I found out that the reason why you ask for something crazy like that is because if you show up and you see that you got the, if that's in your rider like only green M&M's you have to take out every other color out of the M&M bowl if you know that they saw that, or that they, if you see that they did that for you, you know that everything's good. Oh, That's, so it like puts you, it's like reassurance. It's a test. Did you read, uh, yeah, did yeah. you read my writer? And, that's so that's always interesting to me but do you I, have things like that yourself no i don't i'm very easy i'm very my my writer is very easy also because i i don't i always hate when people like over cater things backstage at an event and it's just a waste of all that food that especially like as a singer when you put out three cheese places it's like i'm not eating dairy before i sing anyway so why would you waste all this i'd rather take the cash um <laughs> <laughs> but i don't i i don't uh I don't understand why any of us are doing this if we're not aiming for perfection. Like, why are you, why are we, any art that you create, any event, any, why are we doing this if we're not making it the best possible? If at any point you go, oh, it's fine, no one cares. Well, then, then no one cares if I'm here. Right, That's just my mentality. I like working with obsessive, crazy people in regards to art and production. Because, that that's the stuff that inspired me you know that the stuff that inspired me was stuff that made by crazy perfectionists so if we're not aiming to do it better than it was done you know before or to at least match it what the hell are we doing yeah yeah and that's the kind of how i feel about any job i don't care if you're working at starbucks or if you're uh, uh, a mailman or if you're or a doorman or a, do- or a doorman or a cameraman like whatever it is I I think that it's it's just bizarre to me that you don't do everything to the 
nth degree. Yeah, but I think, and just bring it back to your name again, the thing about your name too is I don't even think it's about perfection, although you're saying like, let's make sure that all of the literature and everything are, what is right. What it says to me is that you wrote that poster and you didn't have, you didn't double check, you didn't do your job. Right, well somebody didn't double check it. But I also I think I could see why you would be extra sensitive to that as your name because first of all, your whole life people have been spelling it wrong. Correct. And to me, that's that's like your identity. It's not, it isn't, equal to your identity but it is part of it so like when you see your name written out and yours is different right. so it's even more important almost because you're correct. not all those Eric's correct and you're there's Eric. a million people that spell Eric E-R-I-C there's a, a few million less that do E-R-I-K and then there's you know a handful that do it my way and I think I, you know I could be wrong but I think I'm the only like you know actor on television right now who's who spells their name that way and it's like mm-hmm. when you're trying to you know when you're trying to have a career it's like <laughs> no and yes you're right it i'm extra sensitive because it's been so many years of this so um and i have to tell you it's an advantage also because i remember just in the last few days if i was typing something in to do a little research background research like i'm finding you on twitter let's say right. as soon as i put that h in you show up right away there you go so this it's is my, handy s- exactly so it's imdb this, or twitter right. or whatever it it's is. the same thing about Madam Secretary. It's spelled M A D A M. But everybody spells it M A D A M E. Right. Which is Wrong. not correct. And people can say, oh, but that's an accepted way of spelling it. Yes, but that's not the television show Madam Secretary. So if you put that on a poster, if I'm just thinking like an advertising person, and this goes back to psychology, if I see a visual, if there's a, if you have a million words or a million television show titles sp- written out on a wall, and you you can see, oh, that's Cheers, that because that spells Cheers, and that's looked that's looked like the word Cheers as I've always seen it. That looks like I Love Lucy. We've always seen those three words in that order spelled that way. But if you see Madam Secretary, your eye is not going to recognize that the way that it would if you spelled it you know what I'm saying if you yeah. if you saw it spelled wrong it doesn't look like the brand it doesn't look like it right. so it, it just drives me nuts especially when it's people who you know should be getting it right Not but you know names. what also i'm going to defend everybody i'm i feel the same way as you first of all but i'm going to defend everybody else who's not the same as us not everybody is visual in that way totally nor is everybody a good speller right so some people they don't have words stick in their brain the way they do for us completely 100% I when I walk into a kitchen and I'm not talking about the let me just for a second I'm not talking ahead. about the posters that is not the same thing no, I understand. but when one of your friends puts you on that totally sends you a message it. and it spells it I totally get it when I say I don't understand I just mean to say my brain doesn't understand I totally get it when I walk into a kitchen it brings me immediate stress. I wouldn't know what to do with a stove. I wouldn't know, I don't know how to cook. I wouldn't know what, any, how anything works. And the idea of kind of like putting fire to that piece of iron and making food out of it, it brings me a level of stress that I can't even begin to tell you. Most people, a lot of friends of mine, when they come home from being on stage, uh, if they finish a Broadway show, they go home and make food because it's an immediate relaxer because it's it soothes them in some way them. I've heard it explained to me that like it's a, that's a control thing as well they're in control of that final product they are it's the one thing in their day that they can control um, so and I can't get that and they can't they don't they don't understand uh, friends of mine who are actors like you know they are actors they don't know what to do unless the lines are given to them the idea of walking on stage and not having any lines written down and just being handed a mic brings them like sweats shakes all of the so we all have the things that that trigger us so i i do get it yeah 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 but I this just... is one of your things i feel you <laughs> for me i'm extra sensitive to when people pronounce my name wrong what do they say so they will before i got married especially i was cara mayer but most people would say Kara Meyer or Kara Meyer or Kara Meyer sounds or Karen like Karen or Kathy or Carol. But how, wait, how do you spell your name? K A R A. And what, how do you spell your last name? So my middle name now is my old last and my maiden name, which is Mayer, M A Y E R. But you know, I guess in German, it's but, pronounced but if Meyer. I see, if I yeah, but if I see M A. That means mayor to me. Well, it does to you, and it does to me, but it right. <laughs> doesn't to everybody. Well, I get. What's interesting, based on where I go, where if I travel or who's saying or where they're from, I get 
uh, my last name is Bergen as opposed to Bergen. Interesting. Yeah. I wouldn't think that. Okay, so how do you feel when somebody calls you Eric Virgin? That one is always laughable to me. I always think that's funny because I was like, when have you ever put a, hard, a soft G there? Like that to me is just an odd... <laughs> right. Like, what, when you, if you see that word, it's interesting that you would think to do Virgin. I mean, I, now that I think about it, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. But I think that's a... It's got to be a geographical thing. Um, it is always funny to me, though, when people say Erich. When people say Erich as a second guessing like if I get into an Uber and they're oh, like oh they'll say Erich? yeah yeah oh. but if, and by the way I have a lot of friends who call me Erich as, as like my nickname for fun totally fine but when I get into like an Uber for example and they say Erich now if they say it second guessing like it comes up on their phone and they say hi are you Erich? And I go no it's Eric but when people saying it say it confidently that makes me laugh hi <laughs> Erich. Cra- I feel like cracking up right now that Eric sounds so silly but people, I know but people say it when people say it confidently like oh that's clearly his name what I want to say is do you know someone named Erich? does that sound like a <laughs> actual name do to you do you say it ever no I, I don't have the confidence myself <laughs> to like get in their face but what I really what I really want to say is really Erich? you think that when that name c- came off your tongue you thought yeah that's it <laughs> really <laughs> sounds so ridiculous Erich. That sounds like something you see a doctor for. <laughs> right. Or, or the, or the cure. You Ask your doctor right about Erich. It's <laughs> just odd to me. It's so funny. So, all right. So let's get back for a second to what you were saying about you started the podcast, your podcast. Yeah. Because you wanted to see people's creative process or whatever, how uh-huh. they start their day, that yeah. kind of thing. So tell me about how you start your day when you're oh. filming it, Madam Secretary, let's say. Well, Madam Secretary, uh, we film we film in Brooklyn, um, and I tend yes, I to know that. Really yes, when you were the there, middle. yes, yeah. In Greenpoint. What did Tim Daly call it? Something like um, oh, something between something and something. I forget, but it was pretty funny. Well, it really stinks there too, right? It's a little well, smelly. We're right near the, right near the chemical plant. Yeah, mm-hmm. the, the, well, the sewage plant, actually, I should say. Um, my day, I well, if we're if it's a filming day, it's usually very early. I mean, if I'm first up in the day. Uh, on the, those filming days, I'm I'm awake at 5 a.m. and then I'm uh, in a, in you know on my way to work by 5:30, 5:40. So, what do you have a car pick you up? Yeah, yeah, and then uh, and then uh, we go to uh, we go to film, and uh, I kind of fall asleep a little bit in the car, and then uh, and then I get there and and do the whole hair and makeup thing, and we're off and filming by uh, you know seven a.m. eight a.m. whatever it is, and uh, it depends. It can be a crazy long day. We can if we start filming at yes two days ago we started filming at I think I was picked up at seven a.m. We started filming probably around nine. And we wrapped around 9.30 at night. Yeah, these are long days. They're I don't long think days. people realize how long they are. But there's also a lot of time in the day of doing nothing, right? Most of it's doing nothing. Right. Well, we've gotten very good on, on our show. There's not a lot of sitting and waiting around. A lot of TV shows, the whole idea of it's hurry up and wait. On on Madam Secretary, we've just gotten very good at not doing that um, because our crew is just so great. There are specific instances we had a big, big party scene that had a musical performance in it. There there was many layers to it. So we had one four-page scene that took from that those that were those hours i mean all almost day. 12 hours like literally all day literally all day and the hard part is you're you're standing up the whole day you know and this because it was a party it was like a cocktail party i was in kind of like crappy not crappy but like actually the opposite of crappy they were like high end dress shoes but those are not comfortable after a certain <laughs> amount of these are all champagne problems i'm just saying yeah, it, yeah. It, you know people don't know that it's a very bizarre process to film a television show. And so what do you do when you're on the other days where there's a ton of time where you're in your dressing room? There's often What do you do in your dressing room? Nothing. I, I'm usually sitting, napping. Uh, I'm a, a, I do transcendental meditation, so I do that. Um, uh, I, 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 there, there isn't a lot of time in my dressing room. There's, there really isn't. I mean, it's, the, it's actually why I have never decorated my dressing room. My dressing room looks like purgatory. You know, other other actors' dressing rooms are like beautifully done up and have great chair. I think I, I have nothing. I'm barely in there. Um, it's the days that I'm not filming that are 
are always interesting because I'm recovering. You know, I'm, I'll sleep in those days, and then it's it's the one day to. Uh, it, what's more interesting is like this past summer when I was doing a Broadway show and Madam Secretary at the same yeah, time. Yeah, waitress. I was doing waitress. But wait, can yeah. we, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Good, let's go back to the days when you're not. You're saying it's boring or whatever. No, no, no. It's just that those are your days to like. Then you have to get everything done in one day. It's like, like your getting, errands. Your errands, yeah, and you're, you're catching up on emails and and things like that. And and when I'm working on my uh, music. I'm, I'm doing things on my day. It's, it's, it's just a lot. And the hardest part of what I do, and this isn't really the hardest part, it's just the weirdest part about what I do, is that you don't, I don't know my schedule more than a week in advance. I know, that is so tough. You that can't plan anything. No, I can't, not really. And not yeah. unless the weekend. So we film only on weekdays uh, for the most part, unless something crazy happens. Um, and when we film on the weekdays, it's, it's eight, uh, eight business days to film an episode. And you don't base it's it's how often I work in that episode. It base you know is how many days I work in that. You don't know that until you get that script, and you only get the script about you know a week and a half in advance of of uh, when you start to work. So I know that I mean we just got the script for the next episode yesterday, but we haven't gotten the schedule for it. So I don't know anything. I don't know my life past next Tuesday. And it's Friday. Just so everybody knows, Correct. right now it's Friday, and you don't know your life past Tuesday. Correct. That's yeah. Oh, that's uh, not not this upcoming Tuesday. Sorry, Tuesday I know after. I know next week. Okay, it's the Tuesday after. So it's it it's just a little weird. Sometimes if it, you know, the incredible thing about Madam Secretary is not only have we done a hundred episodes, but the writers have gotten in a hundred episodes on time. So it's not like some shows where they're waiting around for a script and it's like down to the wire. You hear those stories too. We thankfully haven't had that. However. It's st- we have had instances where we don't get our schedule due to if it's a location heavy episode or if it's if we're shooting in January and there's weather problems and things like that. There can be times where we don't get a schedule until like two days before we start to film. Yeah. Yeah, I know about that as an interviewer. Oh, I'm sure. Because this is, I have to be flexible as well. Right. Because I know that this kind of thing. Absolutely. Is up in the air a lot. So sometimes when I can book somebody like two weeks in advance, yeah. it's such a luxury. Yeah. Can't even tell you. You should try, what I just had to deal with was jury duty. Oh, that's tough. That's really tough. And trying to convince, you have to. How was jury duty? Well, I, you know, here's the thing. I really want to do it. I'm kind of obsessed with it. I'm dying to do it. I love all that stuff. I love law stuff. I love cases. I love, I'm dying to be on a jury. I don't think anyone wants me on a jury, but um, I'm. Why not? I'm, Why not? Oh, they don't want people. They don't want loud mouths like me. They want, you know, they want just kind of like chill people regular on a jury. Yeah. down to earth people yeah, who, yeah, yeah. Uh, don't they, like to perform they, they don't want actors they don't want <laughs> actors and juries okay um but uh i would love to be and i keep trying to like find a time to do you know but um uh i haven't had you need like three days this, i just had this this situation happen where you have like three you have to give them three days in a row where you can be sitting around doing that you nothing yeah. right you can get out of your job and i kept Saying I don't have the three days. I mean, I have them now, but you don't need me today. Right? Like, well, then you can come next week. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah, because they schedule in adva- like well in advance. Normally, they well in advance. Yeah. So I finally, finally, I said, I'm, I'm. I, they're like, well, what's your? J-? They said, no, your your job has to let you out for jury duty. You know, someone else has to cover for you. I said, well, I'm. I, no one can cover my job. <laughs> yeah, somebody comes in and yeah. plays your right. It's like it's not really it's possible. Little, it'd be a little weird. It's not even like Broadway where you have an understudy. It's <laughs> right. like you can't really, you know. Um, so once I explained that, they were like, oh, got it. All right. And then they were able to find a date for me. You know, they pushed me until the like after hiatus. the season. Oh, right. Yes, okay. yes. So I'm very excited. Uh, come my hiatus time, I'm, I'm going to be sitting, waiting anxiously to be put on a jury. Right, so some lucky criminal right now doesn't know it yet. Exactly. <laughs> They're going to exactly. come into uh, your world. I know everyone wants to get out of jury duty. It's like, yeah, but all you do is go home and watch Law & Order. Like, don't you just want to do it? <laughs> People are obsessed with Law & Order, too. And they are. Yeah, yeah, gun, that's gun. true. So, life now, are you... You live alone, right? Or you live? You have somebody here? Oh, I don't want to talk about oh, that stuff. Oh, nothing at all. No, it's not fun. I got her. The, the problem is, the problem is with what I do. Um, you know, uh, it, I don't like making my personal life part of the story. It's just to me, I have the most boring life. I promise you, there is nothing scandalous going on. I'm so freaking boring. But I don't want to. It's the only thing I have for myself. It's the only thing I've got, and it's like. I don't, I, I, when I've gone through something in my personal life, 
if I can turn it into art, I'm all for it. Then I'll talk about it. Like when I, I, I went through cancer and I did chemotherapy and I did the whole thing. And now I have... I have uh, my new music. Uh, the first single is certainly based off of my life for the past five years and was really triggered by that. And it was really, um, uh, and I want to do good talking about cancer and letting people know why they should go get checked and all these different right. things. It was testicular cancer. It was testicular cancer. There's a way for me to use that to do some good. Talk. I hate it when um, uh, artists between jobs or or to get into the to get press or whatever it is use their personal life or not even use their personal life I, I it's just it's just so not interesting to me i'd rather save my personal life for like when i can do good with it understood totally <laughs> I, okay um i bet your life is not boring though because it's real so even if it's real it's not boring it doesn't have to be no, like scandalous or dramatic to be interesting because the human condition and like experience that's is true. all about regular that's true but there's so many other people who are better at it than i am <laughs> we'll leave it to them <laughs> um your new single so yeah. i could tell i was watching the video yeah all right so your single is out now so yeah. people can get it where oh gosh at your local Tower Records. No. Um, you can get it on Spotify. <laughs> Try that and, first. Yeah, exactly. Uh, at, at Sam Goody. Um, Goody got it. Uh, yeah, Goody got it. Um, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, all the different places. I mean, you can get it on your watch now, I think. I don't yeah. even know how, you know, however you listen to music, I'm sure there's a way to get it. Okay, and you wrote it? The lyrics? So, the, yeah, Running Through the Night, I wrote the music and the lyrics. I wrote that one completely. Uh, it was produced uh, by uh, a great, wonderful producer, Seth Jones, who is an artist himself uh, named SJ. Um, uh, and then that's the first single of uh, kind of a series of singles that I'm releasing one by one. Oh, so when are the rest going to come out? Well, when is this airing? I don't know yet. Oh, okay. Well, well, right, what what is it today? November, is today November 2nd? 2nd? So today is November 2nd, 2018. The second single uh, comes out uh, a week from today. Okay, November, so November 9th. That will be out too by the time this runs for sure. Okay, so November 9th is a second song called Better in the Dark, which I co-wrote with some um, uh, three women uh, that I just adore writing with and uh, the third single after that hasn't been decided yet so we'll wait on that one okay. but the first two singles are out Running Through the Night and Better in the Dark and just make sure you're tuned in somehow some way to I, when the other ones are yeah, released if you follow me on all the social media stuff okay. uh, Erich Burgeon and um, <laughs> and if you uh, if you you know follow me on if you have Spotify the best thing to do is like click the follow, follow. button then yeah. you get Whenever it comes out, and while trying you're to teach on my parents Spotify. Spotify by the way, Spotify is pretty easy though. I think while you're on Spotify, you click follow for Really Famous as well because you right. can listen on you to teach Really my dad Famous. How to do it. <laughs> All right, um, maybe I will one okay, day. Good. Um, okay, so look out for the single. The video as well is yeah. interesting to watch, and I could. It looked to me like there was some personal stuff in the video, some relationship yeah, I mean, the stuff. Lyrics, you don't want to get into the details. I no, guess, that but. I can. That I that I can totally. I mean, you know, running through the night is really just a. A personal story of, of what I really learned from going through cancer. I think the, the biggest thing that I took away from it was the doctors will tell you all about symptoms side of the medical side of things. What they don't really tell you about is the anxiety and the fears and all the crazy stuff that creeps up post cancer. You know, you're always walking on eggshells waiting for that C word to pop back up again. You know, you stub your toe, you think of cancer of the toe. Every last headache I've had that's stress induced, I'm sure is a brain tumor. And I run to the ER. I mean, there have been some crazy times that come from it. And people don't want to talk about that because you want to say, you want to kind of say the words out loud to prove to other people that you're okay and you know by reverse psychology be proving to yourself that you're okay but but it's better to say i'm not okay i'm having a full-on breakdown because of this um and and that's the thing that no one prepares you about they just don't tell you about it and so for me running through the night that phrase really came from the idea that it's not about when you fall down you pick yourself back up again and and keep going it's that you pick yourself up again taking with you what you've learned it it's going to age you a little bit it's going to change you it's going to make you grow up but that thing that you had to deal with is part of you now and that should inform and um uh 
it should inform your your life it should give you a new agenda it should change you while you keep going it sh- you shouldn't be like okay that happened and pretending that never happened just dust it off and continue forward so the idea of running through the night was to just there's there's always darkness there's always going to be that darkness keep going keep running I love it. It's beautiful. Thanks. Um, and everybody should watch the video. As it's a well. beautiful video. It's a beautiful I, I'm video. Really Was proud that filmed here? Yeah, we filmed it right in Greenpoint, right, right near where the studios for. Um, actually, yeah. Oh, yeah, we did film that in Greenpoint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In right near the studios for Madam Secretary. Okay, yeah. cool. And I'll have links in the show notes for that. Okay, good. And before we wrap up for full, I have to ask you some quickie questions from fans in your fan club in the uh, oh, no. Facebook Is Madam my Secretary one of group. Them? <laughs> She probably is. You can admit it. Well, you know, she named you Erich. So. There you go. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, this is from Lindsay Walters, who gathered all these questions for me. Okay. What's the best thing you've learned as an actor from Taya and Tim? Oh, um, uh, wow, that's a great question. Probably that you're never going to feel that you nailed it. You're always going to feel that, like, you know, you didn't get it in all the takes that they gave you. You never feel like you got it shot quickly, didn't get it, but then you watch it back and, oh, I got it. It, it was good. So you, you have to get used to the feeling of uh, not confident in what you did. Mm-hmm. Important. What's the hardest thing besides lack of sleep for you when you were juggling Madam Secretary and waitress on Broadway? Oh gosh, I didn't really have a lack of sleep. I, I always, I'm a really good sleeper. Um, I was certainly tired because it's a lot of hours, but I came home and <laughs> immediately. Um, You're always like that? I can sleep anywhere. Awesome. Yeah, I don't have sleep trouble. It's weird. I'm the only one of my friends who does not have sleep problems. Um, what was the... what Toughest what, thing about juggling both. There wasn't anything. Wow. It was the most, it was the, most, it was the happiest I've ever been. That's amazing. It was the most excited I've ever been. And that ended in August. Yeah, but there was a month where it was overlapping where I'd be up at 6.15, 5.15, whatever it is, filming all day and then running to the theater. One time, traffic was so bad in the car that I actually jumped out of the car on a bridge, w- ran back the other way on the bridge, jumped on the subway to get in and walked in the stage door uh, at the Brooks Atkinson Theater at 7.58 to make the 8 o'clock curtain. Nice. Yeah. There was there, nothing everybody bad. was probably was totally time. freaked out waiting for you. Oh, completely. Um, did your co-stars go see you on oh, yes. Perform? And yes. how did, what did that mean to you? Let's put it this way. The the ushers, the other actors, the uh, so, all, all these people said, I, we've never seen that. We've never seen such support for someone like that. We've never seen, and I had never seen it. I've never seen someone's whole job, every, everyone from their one job, come see them do something else. That group is the most supportive. I mean, they all came on one night. Most of them, there were a couple of people who came on other nights, but they all came on one night and they wore these like Miss America sashes that the producer had made that said Team Bergen. And it was like, that's, that's the cast in a nutshell that, Taya, Tim, Joe, everyone, everyone, and the producers and the writers all came together, bought a block of tickets, and and it was like it was like my friends who uh, live in Jersey and Long Island when they're on Broadway and their entire family comes to see the show, which is like all of New Jersey and Long Island. <laughs> they buy out the theater and it's like just applause for them. I had that, but with my coworkers at Madam Secretary, it was unbelievable. Very, very cool. Um, this one is from Kelly. How did you make time for your music and, or how do you make time for your music and Broadway career while working on Madison? Um, I mean, I don't do anything else. You know, I don't have children. I don't, um, I'm not in a softball league. I, I do one thing. I make art. You know, I wake up and I sit at the piano. I am thinking about the next idea. I'm trying to create this. It's, it's truly all hours of making things. That's just all so I do. So it melds naturally. Yeah, it's together. not really about how do I make time. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really about how do I make time to like you know get to the dentist. Right. It's, that, it's the these other are your stuff. priorities. Yeah, it comes yeah, yeah. naturally. What, how much time is there between the end of one day shoot and the beginning of the next day? I guess you kind of answered that already. Well, like you have to have there's a, you have to have a I forget what it is. Maybe it's ten hours or maybe it's twelve hours of turnaround um, f- for the crew, and so it's all based off of that. So when you end right. Right. It's mm-hmm. all based 
based off like you don't know what your call time is the next morning until the previous day wraps so oftentimes i'm waiting even if i'm not at work i'm at home waiting to find out what time they end work that day to know what my call time is the next day but i think it has to be a 12-hour turnaround okay Kristen Davis wants to know, is there something Blake does that totally annoys you? Um, well, he wears a watch, and I can't stand the feeling of a watch on my wrist. Oh, I can't you, you stand don't, it. You don't just forget the feeling after like nope, 10 minutes? Nope. Mm, I want to rip it off at all times. I lost my watch the other day. It fell off, and I didn't even notice. Oh, because it's the, the phantom feeling. I guess. Yeah. Mm. It's Sorry. gone. I called all these restaurants, couldn't find them at the oh, place well. I've been. Um, from Nancy Ramos, what will Blake do when he's no longer... Elizabeth's assistant. Well, that question is referring to um, uh, the fact that last season Elizabeth says, "In one year, I'm firing you." Yes, um, because she thinks that Blake is now overqualified for his uh, assistant job. Um, the answer we well we've we've filmed what happens to Blake. We've we've addressed that. Um, I'm not sure when that episode airs. It's kind of a two parter. Um, and it it's uh, um, it, it it airs. I want to say around Thanksgiving time or something like that. Um, but I'm not going to give away the answer to that because it, it's it's a big point in the show. But something does happen, right? And if this is after Thanksgiving, which it could be, yes. Then what you will say is you You'll, know now. You know now. <laughs> you know now. And the final fan question is actually from Twitter. It's from Eek. On Twitter. I don't that's know. That's the, how you that's spell it. Oh, okay. Or something. All right. Um, other than music and musicals, what do you geek out about? Um, what do I geek out about? Or what do you geek out over? Like, what are you really into? Uh, non arts. Non arts. Oh, gosh. I was just going to say. I know. I knew you were going to go right to arts. So oh, I, I was going to say give fonts. A like, font, I, fonts. Fonts? Fonts. Oh. Like, that's. I, because my mom's a graphic artist, so. You know, she I, I, advertising and fonts and like um, how how we sell things, like all of that's very interesting to me. I don't know what what I'm really obsessed with right now is journalism. How so? Well, I've always loved it, but I think right now this kind of war against journalism that's happening is is kind of reignited that that flame in me. Um, you know, I've always loved one of my favorite movies is All the President's Men. Um, so I've always loved the investigative story, but really the life of the investigative reporter. Not so much the story itself, but the actual job of the investigative reporter. Um, I've always loved, 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 loved that. Um, so I, I, I do love that stuff. I love reading uh, books by reporters. Um, yeah. Very cool. And yeah. so last question I think has to be, what is your favorite font? <laughs> Um, oh gosh, I'm. I do enjoy a copper plate. Beautiful. Thank you, Erich. Erich Virgin. Good to be here. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. That was Eric Bergen. Stay tuned to hear his brand new singles in just a second. If you'd like to see photos of the Michael Jackson coaster and of Eric and me before and after we recorded this, click on the link in the show notes. I'm Kara Mayer Robinson. Thanks for listening to Really Famous. Oh, and if you would like to leave a review of Really Famous on your podcast app, that would be amazing. Hey, this is Eric Bergen. This is my new single, Running Through the Night. I'm getting used to seeing my father's face in the mirror And all my lovers, past and present agendas are clear And I don't know, but it seems like I should have a bit more money by this stage And every day I can't believe I've made it to this age I go running I go running through the night I go I'm a
Hey, it's Eric Bergen again. All right, this is my second single, Better in the Dark. You know that you make me crazy. I know that you don't even think that I care. We talk, but I So let's just clear the air We get lost in all this confusion Somehow we just can't get out of our heads We touch, it's the way we get through this Make it so damn hard and we can just make it easy Make it easy Come on, come on, move a little closer Come on Show me how to go there I, I wanna listen to your heart I hear better in the dark come on, come on. Baby, turn the lights down come on, come on. Love will be the only sound Let me listen to your heart I hear better in the Listen to 